Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Petronas Podcast. This is episode 118 of the Petronas Podcast, and this is part two with Paul Tice. My name is Trisha Curtis. I am the CEO of Petronas and the host of the Petronas Podcast. I am super pumped for this episode. Uh, this is a really, really fantastic conversation. This is part two with Paul Tice. So if you have not tuned in to part one, episode 117 of the Petronas Podcast, please do. But if you're looking for an episode that is a mic drop episode, is where we start talking, you know, getting real on politics and policies and the Harris versus Trump. This is your episode. And it is just, it is really, really good. I'm pumped about it. We're talking about Paul Tice's book, which is up here on how ESG investing will create the global financial system. And really the premise is that, you know, he really talks a lot in the book about how ESG investing is really about how ESG is really about its anti-capitalism. Um, but with that, this, this podcast was recorded on October 2nd. So this is the long conversation really about the book and the context of where we're at with ESG. So this was recorded on October 2nd, but Today is October 23rd, 2024. It is Wednesday, and I'm going to give you a quick update on the market because we are less than two weeks from the election, and it is really, really critical that there's incredible market volatility right now. So right now, we have oil prices at $70.65. Yesterday, last night, I recorded a short video and put it on LinkedIn, and oil prices were 72 bucks. We are losing, we're having these one to two to three to five dollar swings pretty easily right now in the market. You know, we've seen 69, we're about out 70, 70 dollars and 65 cents. Brent is at 74. 84 right now. We have Nat Gas just above about 231 for Nat Gas. And this is really important to put in context that we are 231 for Nat Gas. Europe is nearing about 13, um, 13 bucks an MCF. So that that's really serious because I, I want to talk about a BBC News interview that I did yesterday as well. Um, and I think it's just incredibly important to appreciate how low our natural gas prices are and how high theirs are. Um, but we also have uh, the volatility in the market, which I'm going to touch on. We have gold just ripping. We have gold at over $2,700 an ounce right now. That is really ripped. I mean, I can't tell you how many times you heard calls this year from the stock market and from analysts talking about, you know, concerns about inflation, con concerns about the Fed, concerns about the U.S. economy, and these bets on gold. And you have the 10-year yield well above 4%. It's at 4.2, almost 4.3% right now, 4.226%. That has, that has pushed the 30-year mortgage back up. So this is just incredibly important to put in context. So we have a lot of market volatility that is partly because of the U.S. election in two weeks. But we also have a Fed that lowered a few weeks ago that lowered interest rates a half a basis point. And I have said on this, I've been, you know, for podcasts and podcasts and talking to listeners, talking these, these short updates on LinkedIn and Twitter, but also with, with clients is that the Fed is doing this wrong. The Fed is on the wrong side here. We have not beat inflation and lowering interest rates sort of just allows inflation to rear up. And that is essentially what the market's telling you. You had the stock market boom. You had the Dow go well over 40,000. And the last several days, you've had a nice sell-off in all, across the board in S&P and Dow. And, and that's because the 10-year yield is pushing up. Well, the 10-year yield is directly tied to your 30-year mortgage. And the 30-year mortgage is what the, the Fed wanted to lower. I mean, the one, the, one of the single biggest sticky parts of inflation that actually keeps going up, not down, is housing. And so the fact that you have average housing price in the U.S. is well over half a million dollars. It's priced everyone out. And then to, to mortgage that, it's you're nearing about 7% again. So you're 6.57% for the US average. I still think if you try to get a mortgage today, it'd be well over 7% for most folks. So that 10-year yield, because it's been pushed up, pushes mortgage rates right back up. So everything that the Fed did, because they did it so aggressively and they did it wrong, and they should have waited. They shouldn't have done anything in interest rates. They could have basically come out every month and just been a little bit more dovish, a little bit more dovish, and done nothing on rates, and slowly did 25 basis points, maybe, when it was ready, when they really started seeing some actual erosion in the economy. So that's just you know where we're at right now. And so we have this all this market volatility. We have this election in less than 2 weeks and you know according to polling which we know has been atrocious in the last in the last several elections we this is at a razor knife edge. You have lots of folks that get on CNBC, that get on Bloomberg that talk and say, "Hey, actually Kamala is going to win big" versus people actually betting in the stock market and you actually see the bets for the Trump win are clear within the stock market. So you have folks betting on that. Now that could be people just putting their money where their mouth is, they want him to win, and so they're betting on that and there's some benefit to that, right? There's actually a benefit to where if people think he's winning, you know, people want to vote for the winner. And so that that really actually emphasizes people or re 
invigorates and gets people excited and gets them um, to the polls um, to actually vote. And there's a couple things I am hearing. You know, there were some great political analysts on Bloomberg surveillance yesterday that were talking about, you know, Trump has, a, they're talking about the Republicans have a much better ground game. And you hear criticism if you're pulling up your Apple News feed. You know, there's a lot of negativity, always negativity on Trump um, and, and, the, and the conservatives. But what you're hearing from really good political analysts is that one, the ground game for in the states that matter, like Pennsylvania, the, the uh, Republicans have been pretty good. And so Trump has pulled out all the stops. He's got Elon Musk actually campaigning with him and actually at at his rallies talking. He was at McDonald's and there's a whole thing going on with McDonald's right now. Um, but he was at McDonald's over the weekend, um, which was, a, a, a according to these political analysts and to myself, is a great campaign move. Um, and so you have all this going on. And so these market bets could be reflecting that, that they think he's actually going to win, or it could be people just wanting to it, it to look like it. It's basically a form of advertisement. So regardless, there are bets in that favor. And I think it's important to point this out because um, Paul Tudor Jones was on CNBC on Squawk Box yesterday morning. And he said a couple of really, really important things that I just want to highlight. So he said he was you know, he, I think he was basically making bets in both directions, but he was making bets and, and knew of a lot of people making bets that Trump was going to win, but he wasn't going to say who he was voting for. I think it's, it's pretty clear if you're pro-business and um, you're pro-economy, you're probably voting for Trump. But he was talking about con massive concerns over the fiscal deficit. And I, I, I'm in a bit of disagreement in, with Paul Tudor Jones in terms of, and, and many analysts actually saying that, you know, Donald Trump is worse for the fiscal deficit than Kamala Harris. I, I do not think that is true. I think what you saw, yes, the, the deficit has increased under every president, has definitely increased under the Republicans with, with Trump. It increased massively, massively under this Biden administration when, when Congress and Biden were spending like drunken sailors and just spending it like crazy. And the problem with a lot of that is these big pork spending bills like the Inflation Reduction Act, you know, they're just they're just massive spending bills. They're not the Inflation Reduction Act. They're, um, as Paul Tudor Jones said, it's an Inflation Reactivity Act. Um, but they they put all this pork in it, and they're not good spending. So things that we saw, you know, we saw this uh, back in the day when when we had the financial crisis and we had all this massive spending, and you had Pelosi getting on on you know TV and getting on. Uh, to Congress and saying, we have to pass this, or the America will never recover. And there's so much crappy spending in it that it didn't, you had spending and it didn't go to good places. But see, back then we didn't have this inflation and now we do. So every additional piece of crappy spending just enhances inflation. And you are hearing that, you're hearing that folks within, you know, the administration is desperately trying to spend these dollars that they've awarded that they actually haven't been able to spend all of them. So it's very, very hard for the Biden administration to take credit for much except for big pork spending bills and inflation. Um, but that being said, Paul Tudor Jones said a couple things. And he said that, you know, there he calls this KFAB. And I thought this was this was really funny and nerdy, but he, he said he loves wrestling. So he loves wrestling. And there's something in wrestling like you know where it's fake, right? The audience knows that's choreographed and, and the wrestlers know it's choreographed, but you sort of agree with this. And um, he said it's called KFAB, a word is called KFAB. And so he was calling this basically economic KFAB, where everyone knows the the administration and economists and and everyone sort of knows that this is kfab right that we have this masculine fiscal deficit and we have to write this story at some point now i think that's a great way to describe it he says that you know basically we're going to have to raise we're going to have to raise taxes no matter what and uh you're going to have to raise taxes like 49% for people making over $200,000 a year i think the economic that would be an economic catastrophe. You would you would really kill the economy. So I don't think that's a, a starter. And I heard some contrary things. You know, Rick Santelli, he's fantastic on CNBC. He always has been. He was he was on the record for calling out Obama during the Obama administration. I thought I've always thought he was brilliant. And yesterday, last night, I was listening to CNBC, and he was talking about, hey, you know, there's a lot of things that we can do, but we do have to write this problem. And that four point two. Over 4.2% on the 10 year old is telling you we have inflation, we have fiscal deficit, and we no one has been honestly talking. So they're talking about future, they're talking about you know Trump, and they're talking about Harris, but they're not owning that the Biden administration has spent so much and it's been so inflationary, and they own this inflation, and that is Kamala Harris. She is the party, and she's the continuation of the Biden administration, which is inflationary, it's pro regulation, and it's damning and destructive to the U.S. economy. And 
I, if you can tell I'm passionate about this, I really, really am, because I just think the media is giving her a total pass, just as they did with Biden, talking about Biden as an absolute moderate, which he wasn't, and they're th- saying the same stuff about Kamala Harris, which she's not. She's going to, she's she's being talked about as a moderate, and she's going to rule like a far-left Democrat, um, like the Biden administration has. And it will be much, much worse, especially for energy under Kamala Harris than it has been under the Biden administration, and that is absolutely saying something. But Paul Tudor Jones also said something else, and he talked about economic catastrophes. And I, I've talked a lot to to uh, clients over the past couple of years and to listeners, and I am, you know, a lot, I'm in the Jamie Dimon camp where I see all these problems in the world because I study them. I study economics and geopolitics for a living, and I'm a macroeconomist. And there's nothing in the global economy that is positive. And I think the International Monetary Fund, IMF, last night came out and said that yesterday and said they've reduced global growth forecasts. The only country that's really growing is the U.S., but everything's being reduced, including Europe, including China. And Europe is a massive I mean, it's a massive, it just, it's in, uh, I think, a terminal decline because of the overregulation, really because of the aggressive green, partly because of these aggressive green policies and very, very high cost energy, which is underpins their entire economy. And I saw this because I was in Europe just over a week ago, and you can just, you can see it and feel it, especially if you're talking to manufacturing folks. Um, and it's just, it's very, very sad. But he, he mentions that, you know, economic catastrophes, they take, you know, they basically brew over the course of years, but they happen in weeks. And I think that's so important for people to realize is that think about when Lehman Brothers collapsed, which it really shouldn't have collapsed. And there's a chapter in in Paul Tice's book about that. But when Lehman Brothers collapsed, that was a straw that broke the camel's back. But everything was already collapsing around it. You had 2007, 2008, where these mortgage-backed securities were failing, and it just all came to fruition. So I think you have to realize that is that, you know, Jamie Dimon, Paul Tudor Jones, I think about Warren Buffett pulling, taking all this cash and putting it on the sidelines, you know, they're, they are making bets on this. And I, you know, people always say you need to be invested and you, you do. I mean, I'm not saying you, you shouldn't be invested and I'm not an investing podcast. I'm not advising anyone on what to do with their money or an investment advice. So that's a, you know, my legal disclaimer. However, I think it's important to realize that the market in terms of, again, I always come back to oil and where we're at for the oil economy it doesn't look good. You know, oil prices are telling you they're leading indicator. I mean, the fact that people keep talking about the U.S., you know, doing so well and we have oil prices at 70, that's really telling you that Europe is really not doing well and China is really, really not doing well. And, you know, I was in Europe a couple of weeks ago and it was amazing to fly into the Munich airport. I was flying in and meeting my boyfriend because he had he had meetings in Italy and and meeting with some manufacturers. And that was just incredibly enlightening because the competition that these guys are facing from China is insane because China just dumps these really, really crappy products on them. And that the cost of energy is just, it's just, the weight of it is insane. But when you fly into Munich, you see this big sign that says net zero 2050, which is just laughable. And what you're hearing about German, it, the German economy is that their work week is shortened. I mean, this is the industrial powerhouse of Europe, one of the industrial powerhouses of the world. And they are looking at a half of their auto manufacturing capacity is sitting idle. And the German people are not, they don't have the same work ethic, the same drive that they did before. And I think, and they have the second highest electricity prices in the world. I think Netherlands is the only one that's higher. And so the weight of all this, of this incredible regulation of these high energy prices are weighing on industry. And then you have Olaf Scholz, who just has his head in the sand and he's doubling down on China, which you thought he would have learned his lesson on Russia, but he did not. And this gets me to another point. I did a BBC News interview yesterday. And so yesterday morning, I did a BBC News interview. I was asked, uh, you know, I was interviewed beforehand and talking about, they wanted me to talk about the election and what was going on with energy and the election and the fact that it hasn't been well covered. And I, I disagreed from the start that election, the energy in the election and and climate hasn't been a big deal. And so this is their Rare Earths, uh, I I think this the Rare Earths podcast. This is going to drop on Friday, the same day this podcast is actually dropping. So I actually recorded this because I didn't know if BBC would cut me dramatically. So I recorded myself. So I'll be releasing some of that. Um, But I really encourage you guys to take a listen because it was incredibly enlightening to hear the types of questions. It was very combative. Um, I was clearly the only one that was basically pro-energy and um, understood the economy, was talking about energy in the context of energy security and the economy. And I was actually asked about that. One of the, one of the announcers said, you know, he said, uh, you know, you, you come out this from energy security and an economic perspective. And as though that was an anomaly. And that's really impressive to think about because, I mean, th- Europe is, is a mess right now, especially because of regulation and these aggressive green policies, but so is the UK. I mean, it's just, 
you, they talk about the the cost of living and the inflation that they have in the UK, and it's incredible. And really, the fact that inflation has been reduced in the UK and across Europe, it's not a good thing. The reason it's been reduced is because their economy is in outright decline right now. So the the interview was just very telling in that one their approach to the questions the fact that they interrupted me and were it was pretty combative and they they clearly um didn't agree with my answers they did let me talk which was important um but i had to disagree with most of everything how they approached every question saying i think the end of it was the woman said you know the wind and solar are the future and i said i disagree with that heartily i think natural gas is the future and it it really just did not take into account this really important thing that I've been banging home in the last several podcasts and talking to folks about is that is grid reliability is the baseload power generation, which comes from coal and natural gas, wind and solar. I mean, not only do they come from China and they're made with forced labor and they're made with coal, but they're pretty poor forms of energy. The power density of wind is a thousand times less than natural gas. Natural gas is a very energy dense fuel and it works very, very well for power generation. But when we force wind and solar into the grid, as we're seeing in Colorado, as we're seeing in California, as we're seeing across the US, you have a direct correlation with rising electricity prices. That is just, we don't want to become Europe and that's exactly what's happening in the US. So you have to stop the bleeding by stopping the decommissioning of coal and adding more natural gas into the grid um, and, and stopping the addition of this wind and solar, which is just really, really poor policy making because not not only when you add this, you have a direct correlation with cost increases, which wasn't addressed in the BBC at all, but it's inefficient forms of energy. You have to have redundancy, so you have to have more of them than you actually need, which is expensive. You have to put all this transmission, which is expensive, and then it doesn't work. It doesn't work when the light, when the wind's not blowing, and it doesn't work when the sun's not shining, which is means that if you believe in climate change and you think we have, a, or just have weather, extreme weather events, these are really not good forms of power generation in these circumstances. Same with batteries. So that, that's all just to point out that this we have a lot of work to do on the education front, on the market front. Super, super important. Um, I, I spoke at the Colorado School of Mines to Society of Petroleum Engineers, to petroleum engineering students. And I have to say, this will be released as a podcast. But I was, I was quite blown away that almost all the questions were focused on CO2 emissions. And there was a, an understanding, I feel, and like an acknowledgement and understanding of, of the level playing field, of, of just where energy was at in the, in the market, in the world, and the fact that oil and gas and traditional fuels and coal are still the dominant fuel power of the world. They're 80, 82% of the entire primary energy consumption of the world. And, and more so, it, you know, over 50% of, of is coal and natural gas for China alone, almost 70%. So that's just really, really important to put in context. So I'm, I'm talking with them. I'd love to be teaching a course at Colorado School of Mines to helping this and, and really getting out to more college students so that when kids come in and they come into the industry, whether it's oil and gas or otherwise, that they have a deep understanding of geopolitics, of war, of, of the actual fabric of what's going on with of, of how the economy works and how geopolitics work and how energy works in that context. And so two of the last things I'll point out is that, so that we need to do that. And I, I will give, I, I tell folks that I give, you know, I criticize the industry, but I give props where props is due. And the CEO of Baker Hughes um, was on CNBC today. And, you know, he gets props for this because he talks about something. And I tried to get this across in the BB, to the BBC yesterday um, because they had mentioned bridge fuel and I shouldn't have said bridge fuel, but he said, you know, the CEO of Baker Hughes said today on CNBC. So they asked him about, they asked him this morning about, out, um, the election, which he didn't, you know, he kind of dodged and didn't really talk about, which is fair because he's going to, he's going to work within the system, whoever wins. But he, he's, they asked him about the LNG pause. And he said, he thought that the LNG pause would be in the rearview mirror in 2025, which means he probably is thinking that Trump's going to win, but also that, uh, he talked about natural gas and he said, not only is it a transition fuel, but it is a destination fuel. And I think that is so critically important that he says that we all know that that's 100% and completely true. But but the fact we need industry leaders and we need folks in the market, in the stock market and in public earnings calls to be talking about this so that it can be assessed and analyzed in that context. So massive, massive props. And lastly, I'm just going to point out before we have this amazing conversation with Paul Tice and all these mic drop sessions is that I want to say this, and this is so important, is that so Kamala Harris has been getting flack and their campaign has been walking a statement back that the campaign has said. Um, I talk about this with Taylor um, Millard. He is the uh, he works for Inside Source and he, uh, he called me up yesterday and I was interviewed by him. So there's a, there'll be an article that comes out on that. But the, the quote that he asked me about, and it's so important for the industry and for the context of this conversation is, quote, this is from Kamala Harris's team, her, uh, her campaign team, quote, just to be clear, Vice President Harris hasn't said anything that the administration hasn't already said. 
She's not promoting the expansion of fossil fuel drilling. She's just said they won't ban fracking. Un end quote. Case in point, that is the Kamala Harris administration if you get it elected. She is absolutely telling you that I am just pacifying you to say I am not banning fracking, but I am not a proponent of this industry. And you can be damn sure that she's going to do everything in her power along with that entire team to make it very, very difficult for you to do business. And I say this to the folks of the industry listening, but I also say this to everyone else of how critically important energy is to the entire world and human thriving and human flourishing, everything that Chris Wright talks about. It's so, so incredibly important, and we have to have a level set on this. So with that, folks, thank you guys so much for listening. Really appreciate it. You are going to absolutely love this podcast. Can't wait for the feedback. Bye, folks. This is part two of the conversation with Paul Tice. We're talking about the race to zero. This is his book, How ESG Investing Will Crater the Global Financial System. I have this book. I have nearly finished it, but uh, this conversation. So I have Paul here with me today and we uh, went long in the first part of the conversation. So we're turning this into a two-part episode. So if you haven't listened to episode 117 of the Petronas podcast, please do. Um, that's the first portion with Paul. And this now part two, we're going to get into more of the book. We're going to talk about, um, we're going to get more, a little more about, about politics and what's going on and just sort of the state of ESG and further the conversation. But thank you so much for listening. And this is part two with Paul Tice. And I'm going to start this this sort of next segment, because I want to continue a little bit on the politics. And I would say actually going through your book and, um, you know, catching up on the market, I have been super deep in the weeds in um, on China and coal and China's long term coal use and what that means for for China as a as a as a power, as a coal power. And something I really want to you know, if you're if you're listening to Paul and you're thinking, wow, gosh, this sounds this sounds intense and crazy. One, you really need to listen to you need to really need to read the book because it's fantastic. And he's done an incredible amount of research in any of us who dive this deeply into these topics, we get pretty heated and we get pretty passionate because it's like the world's go, all this stuff is happening and nobody's really paying attention. And so it's been incredibly serious. And so, you know, I say this, I say this wholeheartedly. I mean, his, the investigation and the research is phenomenal and it's really well written. Um, so we're going to get into that in a little bit, but I want to start off this second part by, you know, I want to talk a little bit more about the, just clarifying a little bit on the politics of Trump versus Harris on ESG on the politics. But can we, can I just ask you to clarify, you mentioned 2030, you, you talk about this a little bit in your book. I can't remember how much you talk about in the article, but the importance of 2030 as the date. And then you talk about, um, I, I just want to talk a little bit about, you know, if we're, when we think about wars and realities. And so um, I'm going to come to that in a second, but maybe quickly, if you can just address the, the 2030 comments, because you mentioned that in the book and you've mentioned that just now, what is the importance of 2030? Sure. So, I mean, if, if you look at all of this, right, and I, and I try and give the background to, you know, how did we get in this current mess? Um, and you have to go back 40 years to the 1980s, right? And so who's really, what's the group that's really behind climate change, sustainable development, and also ESG? You know, it, it's the United Nations primarily, right? It's, it's NGOs, it's member governments uh, of the United Nations, it's the World Economic Forum, you know, these are the groups that have been pushing this agenda and it's all about climate, right? Sustainable development goals, 12 of those 17 goals that the UN has come up with have a climate component to it. So that's all about climate change. And when you talk about ESG, no matter who you talk to, the number one priority ESG factor is climate change. Right. So all three of these verticals, if you will, that the UN is running are all about climate. And you can think about ESG as basically the funding mechanism for the climate agenda. But they've been telling us since 1990, you know, that we have to get off fossil fuels. And a lot of their, you know, scaremongering has been wrong, right? You know, the world's going to end. The ice will, will melt up in Greenland by this date. You know, Al Gore has been famous for, for getting his projections wrong, right? But by 2050, net zero is the goal, right? And that's under the Paris Agreement. But the interim step there, by 2030, there has to be very aggressive emissions reduction in all of the member countries. And again, it's only the developed economies that are doing any actual right. emissions cutting. And the third world is just watching from the sidelines. But if you look at Europe and the U.S., the goal is to cut emissions by roughly 50 to 55 percent between those two developed regions. Right. And that in this country will take us back to a 1960s level of emissions. Right. And obviously the economy is 40 times larger. So 
how do you square that circle? You know, no one ever explains that. And right. you can't decouple fossil fuels from economic growth. Yep. You mentioned before about this is all about capitalism. I agree. And if you want to take it back past the 80s, you can again look at this in the context of every anti-capitalist movement for the last 200 years. I mean, going back to Marxism. With Marxism, the idea was to control the capitalist system through the labor function, right? With ESG, it's the same thing. You want to control the capitalist system and the, and the free markets through the capital function. And I think that's much more effective, right? And this is basically the government working through the private sector and the financial markets to basically steer, you know, the economy and society towards the desired goals, right? So government clearly has a hand here, but it's behind the scenes. And that's another thing people don't realize, right? All of these groups, starting with the United Nations, are government affiliated. Right. So, and, and the World Economic Forum calls itself a public-private partnership, right? So the, the way I would describe that institution, which is you know the par- clearly the partner of the, of the UN when it comes to sustainability and climate, um, their partnership is basically like a master limited partnership, right? So you have a general partner and you have right. a limited partner. Who has all the power in that partnership? It's the GP, right? So it's the government telling the private sector what to do. Not really an equal partnership. And that's clearly how ESG works, right? And that, they call it stakeholder capitalism. That's basically a description of fascism, right? And so we we should, and I'm I'm talking about the real meaning of that word, not how that's been kind of distorted Mm -hmm. the last few years. Um, But you can view this as another way to go after capitalism and a very effective way because without fossil fuels, and that source of energy to drive economic growth and living standards and freedoms, you know, if you can control that with some bogus emission standard and a climate test, you can control every individual in the economy. I mean, well, you, you can't you can't minimize how this is designed to give political control over every individual in America. Um, so you do a great job. I think the word control and that the word control is really big. And I, I say that not as an alarmist for folks for folks listening, but I do. I study China very, very deeply. And I think if you if there's one word I could describe the Chinese government is control it, in one word is that their desire. And so it's really fascinating to me. And I want to loop back to China in, in a second. But you did a great job describing that. And you really allude to getting more into the book, which we're going to do in the, the second half or this part two. Um, okay, so another qu- quick question before we move on. Um, so we talked about where's the state of ESG. And I, I do think one of the reasons I wanted, you know, I've, we've been on some calls recently on some uh, some similar calls and on ESG topics and everything. And I do think there seems to be a bit of a disconnect lately where people think that because uh, you get an email from Strive, or at least I do, and it says every time there's a DEI, and that's diversity, equity, inclusion, uh, segmented differently a little bit from ESG, environmental, social, and governments, that there seems to be a, uh, when people are, seem, seem, people do seem to be getting excited that there are certain companies that are like Coors and um, Tractor Supply and Ford are all dropping their DEI stuff. And I think there's a risk that people are thinking and conflating this as they're dropping their ESG stuff. And this is where I think this is so important from a manufacturing standpoint and utility and the ability to access, to be able to just do business and have access to appropriate forms of energy to do business. I'm curious, is, is that correct? Am I interpreting that right? Is there Are people over conflating that we're having a movement against ESG because there's some dropping of the DEI and are they together or are they separate? Because in the book, you kind of allude to the fact that they are, they are very, very well linked. Yeah, no, no, this is all part of the same agenda, but I I think, you know, there's been opposition to ESG over the last few years, which is good, but I think some of that opposition has been, you know, misplaced. And I think just focusing on DEI and CRT and LGBTQ, some of these culture war issues, if you will, and, and that's not, I mean, I don't use that terminology to, dimin- to uh, diminish it. I think, obviously, if you're a, a young parent with young children in the school system, those are important issues, right? And you probably need to fight that fight, you know, at, at, the, at the town and the school level, right? But when it comes to the financial markets and ESG and what the priority focus has to be, you know, DEI is a, sh- is a sideshow, right? I mean, the fact that companies are coming out and joining all these groups and making these pledges 
uh, and, and making public statements, whatever there's, you know, the latest social issue of the day, is just basically an indication that the system is working. Everyone is afraid not to speak up in, in, in favor of these leftist causes, right? I mean, these DEI, that there's no, there's an even weaker argument that that drives better company performance, right? So, um, you know, that's even more of a fraudulent argument than, than carbon emission. But, but why is it, why is it becoming, so I, 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 you know, I know from being a woman in the oil and gas business with a company called Petronerds, when I doubled down in 2020, when most of my peers, to your point in the book, you mentioned how a lot of young people left the space. I knew everyone. There was tons of people just left oil and gas and, and went to energy, became energy transition experts. And I doubled down on oil and gas because I'm third generation and thought I'm going to be the, there are going to be 12 people left that know hydrocarbons and geopolitics. And I'm damn sure going to be one of them. But there seems to be now a where, so I know when you hold your ground and you do the research, it can stand through the storm. But I would say that it does seem to be easier for companies to, you know, I, I wonder if there's a little bit of hope that companies can start dropping ESG, and maybe they can't because the new all the rules you're, we've been talking about. But they're able to drop the DEI and just focus on doing business. And I think part of it's because they're losing money. I mean, you know, Disney has gotten hammered, and it's no question. If you watch the movies, ask your friends if, which movies they've watched on Disney. It's a handful. I mean, it's Star Wars, and that's basically it because it doesn't have a lot of politics in it. But a lot of the other stuff did, and it changed the way people actually. I mean, you got to develop a product that people like. Starbucks has this issue. I mean, it comes down to just making a good product and people having the money to buy it. But I just wonder if, if we're thinking that if they're dropping the DEI because they're focusing on a business, is there hope that they're going to start pushing back? on ESG because it's also going to impact their bottom line, which is sort of the, the fiduciary responsibility if they're publicly traded. Yeah. So let me say that Disney has kind of been dead to me since the third, fourth and fifth Star Wars movie. Um, and, you know, the recent ones, my God. Um, so, I mean, there are there are companies out there that you can't save. And I would say Disney is in that category. I mean, they've chosen their path and it's shocking, but they're going to go where they they want to go. I just, been, I just finished clone, Bad Batch and I really liked it, but I'm a nerd. So anyways, continue. Some of the companies like Tractor Supply, uh, like Harley Davidson, you know, more conservative brands, I would say is a fair way to describe them. Clearly, there was no reason why they were wading into this this cultural issue around DEI. It didn't help their business. And clearly it's, it's more of a negative, kind of like the Bud Light issue, right? Right. Um, you know, having a transgender, quote unquote, uh, uh, spokesperson for your your beer brand. I mean, it's crazy. It's an American beer brand, but they have a European parent, and I think that's one reason why um, you know Anheuser Busch has really not come out and really you know you know reset the table sufficiently, in my opinion, um, in terms of that that incident last year. I mean, it's more than a year now. It's because they have a European parent who's completely bought into the CSG thing. And well, they again, thought they solved it by getting Peyton Manning in a Super Bowl ad um, with I, the lights. And... Yeah, no, I, I think they could have gone more aggressive in terms of humor to really have freed themselves and, and you know, made fun of what they did. Yeah. But they wouldn't make fun of what they did because, again, that'll bring down the activists on them. So, but, but certain companies, you clearly see that you're going to lose market share. You're going to drive your customer base away. So they've got to drop this DEI. But... I don't know how many companies would be as willing to, to drop net zero and start saying this, this climate is not an emergency. I mean, I, I think companies, including energy companies and all of society, frankly, are afraid to speak that out loud because they've been indoctrinated so long. They've been told that there is no debate. The science is settled. Even people professional in the markets will not say that out loud. Right. Yeah. But we're seeing it. My question is, we're seeing it. So, uh, you know, ConocoPhillips was one of the first, com they were one of the first independent oil companies to actually adopt the net zero 2050. And I was very public about criticizing them for this. I didn't think it does any of these oil and gas companies anything to adopt all these ESG metrics, which doesn't help their share price performance. I think some thought it did, but that was actually $85 oil prices. Um, now you won't, you can't find it anywhere. You can look through ConocoPhillips, uh, their, their, at least their slide decks and presentations, net zero is not mentioned. So, you know, they've quietly draw, it feels like the oil and gas industry and you hear a little bit, I think, as well from Chevron, you know, they're 
uh, and Chevron actually is a little more uh, poignant. I think Mike Worth has actually turned around, and, and so has Exxon to a degree. And and I give I give credit where credit is due. And at least when you know Exxon purchased Pioneer, you know you heard you heard them both talking about the technicals about the business, right? The rock and in, increasing production, and not about all the ESG stuff. And so I wonder if it's they could be better about you know saying, hey, this is why we're not talking about. But instead, the reality is they're just not addressing it. So they're quietly dropping it. Now, obviously, they have all this compliance. I'm just, I'm hoping for some hope. And before we, you know, close this podcast in part two, I do want to think about what is the, what are the to do things? What, what can be done to proactively, constructively sort of push back on this? But is there some, you know, are you seeing people or companies actually drop this? And is there a way to, you know, flip the script where we can prove that it, you can uh, be a well-managed company as we have for decades and produce oil and gas and actually make money and it and it punches a hole in all these ESG metrics. Yeah, I, I think the issue with the energy industry and I would say ConocoPhillips, you know, their share price has been driven by them buying up, you know, Permian focused right. companies like Concho and Marathon. Um, but I mean, it's ridiculous why any energy company would, would set a net zero target. I mean, fine, it's probably scope one and scope two, but you know, some of them have talked about scope three. I mean, that basically means you're shutting down, right? Yep. Or, or to set a target and say, well, it's we're going to reduce our intensity. Well, okay, that's great. But the other side doesn't care about your intensity. They want you to shut down your production and your absolute emissions. So the energy industry, and I think we talked about this last time, it's been stuck for the last 20 years in this bargaining phase, thinking yep. that they can yep. just reason with the other side and maybe they'll be the last segment or company left standing. And, and so it's a divide and conquer strategy. Right. You've got Oxy, you know, doing its own carbon capture thinking, oh, well, we'll be really net zero if this technology ever works, which it never will. And then Exxon is doing the same thing by investing and, and just sinking capital, wasting money on a science experiment, right? Or, or you know, Kinder Morgan is buying a renewable natural gas business with all this development expense, even though we've got plenty of natural gas at much lower cost yep. in this country, but it's to, to earn green points with them. Yep. So even the energy industry, which I I agree what the other side has been saying for years, fossil fuel companies, particularly Exxon, have known about the science and haven't said anything. Well, I think that's true, but they know that the climate data and the climate science is false. All these projections we're talking about um, are not realistic, right? And again, we should not be restructuring our economy in this country, if not globally, based on bad data and bad science. And I think it's gonna to come to the point, clearly appeasement hasn't worked until now, that the energy company is gonna to need to come out. And it's also not good enough just to be cynical and say, you know, we're gonna be using, you know, 80% fossil fuels in 2050, which is basically their way of saying, you guys will never achieve any of this. But that doesn't mean they're not going to try and they're not going to cause a lot of economic damage, particularly for, for individuals in the poor strata of society. Right. I think the industry, which is a very patriotic industry, in my opinion, should be saying more in defense of themselves and the American consumer. And that's going to require them to challenge the climate orthodoxy, which, again, I have not seen anyone really come out and say that. I've seen people speak up all the positives around fossil fuels but we need the other piece too because only then will will i think republicans more republicans get some backbone you know if they have you know that support there's strength in numbers if people yeah, talk out about it then more yeah. people will be okay going out on a limb and saying these things in public and we really need the republicans to lead the charge because you know in the last chapter i go through this but this is going to require government resources to bring the lawsuits needed to reverse all these regulations and, and rulings. And that's going to require support at the red state level, because up until now, we haven't been able to, to, to rely on the federal government. Uh, and even during the, the first Trump administration, he stopped the forward progress of, of all of this, but he didn't keep pushing, right? And if we really want to regain territory and stop this thing, we have to go after all of the climate regulations that were passed illegally. We have to go after the Paris Agreement, which was not ratified by the Senate. We have to go after the Sustainable Development Goals, 
which also was not ratified by the Senate. And then we have to revisit the endangerment finding, which was passed by the EPA under Obama. And clearly that was a political ruling. So that's going to you know, take some backbone, uh, if not other body parts, but we're going to have to be aggressive. And I think, you know, we're going to need lawmakers to, to lead that charge. Well, so you do a great job in, in characterizing this and bringing this back to politics, actually, which is what I want to do, but on leadership. And I think you see this. I mean, you're with the with the new National Center for Energy Analytics, and I've joined some different groups. And um, I do get frustrated with the industry, and they know this. But I mean, being in the industry, because a lot of you know people who work in the industry care deeply about it, and they understand it. And you, the reason you see so many engineers and so many intelligent people within the oil and gas community that are knowledgeable about this is because they've they've are tired of being told that they're wrong. And then they go research this and they realize, oh my gosh, you guys are outside your minds. And so when you spend, you know, I've, I've pulled all the Energy Institute data, which is formerly BP. The only reason BP got rid of that data was because they were tired of being, you know, they were tired of being the guys that said, hey, the world isn't changing and you're not transitioning. And so if you pull the Energy Institute data and you actually go through it and you go through every single country in this world and you break out OECD, which is the developed world, you break out the non-OECD, which is the developing world, China, you know, Russia, India, and your BRICS, and you look at the actual oil and gas consumption, and you look at the power, historical power generation, there, there are three, I mean, they're major, major trends, is that you know, oil and gas actually is a friend to emissions for, for the OECD. Our primary energy source is, our, and I think it's so, so serious, I haven't heard anyone talk about this, but primary energy consumption, we always talk about how it's, you know, still largely o- a traditional fuels. It's oil, gas, and coal. But we don't talk about that the U.S. primary energy consumption and Europe and the developed world is still oil, gas, and coal, which means that oil portion, let's say it's 30 percent, it's driving, it's transportation, it's moving goods. What we don't see in the OECD, particularly in China, it's disproportionately electricity, and that's disproportionately coal. So for China, over half of the primary energy consumption is coal. If it was a little bit more oil, that would have less emissions. And personally, and I've said this on the record, and I said this to state legislators in Wyoming a couple weeks ago, I do not think CO2 emissions are their number one goal. I think we have way bigger issues going on in the world. No, I don't think we're all going to hell in a handbasket by 2030 and we're, we're burning down. But that all being said is if you're fighting the CO2 emission battle, one, you're not winning because it's just increasing in China. But that primary energy consumption is huge. And China has quietly tilted an unlevel playing field where they didn't have enough oil and they've retilted this on everything is on coal. So the fact that they were concerned about energy security and their exposure to oil has led them to disproportionately lean into coal. Their whole grid is based on coal. Yes, they have some renewables, but it means that they're, um, it's a pretty dirty economy. And so the, my point that I'm making is you're not going to win the battle. This is a whack-a-mole with CO2 emissions, and you're not winning it. You're making it worse. And I, I think that once we can have, if we could have a level set in saying this is where we're at, and you know, and the reason I say this is because China is such a bipartisan issue, and no one is working on energy in China. I am, but very limited entities and people who are China and energy experts are no offense, but they're kind of crap. Um, they just, you know, take what China says and they go with it. So there seems to be a reckoning, you know, a reconciling of that, and then. The war with, you know, you, Russia invading Ukraine, that was a level set, right? That was a quick, like, hey, we're not getting Russian gas. McDonald's, you know, you're not going to be doing business in Russia. You mentioned this in your book. You know, um, Starbucks, uh, Exxon, everybody pulls out of Russia immediately or loses all their money. People don't realize that, yeah, we have $500 billion of trade with China, but that could end tomorrow, too, if we have a war. And so, you know, things like CO2 emissions become not as important in the world when those things happen. And so it's really important if you're enabling China in that process, you're not helping CO2 emissions, nor you're, you're going to exacerbate this. So I just think geopolitical realities and just realities and costs are huge. And I'm wondering if any of those will help level set the conversation and just bring us back to reality that the transition is not happening, um, the coal usage is increasing, and you're exacerbating it uh, by pushing these initiatives on the developed world. Well, I, I would throw in that you're, I mean, we clearly have issues of dependency on China, which were exposed during the pandemic. And if we keep going down this path, we're going to be even more dependent on them if we try to electrify everything because of their stranglehold right. on uh, rare earth minerals, you know, solar panels, what have you. So everything, so this, this will not make us energy independent, you know, as the Democrats phrase it. Uh, it'll it'll place our economy more at risk. And as you say, 
you know, the risk right now geopolitically, again, what's going on in the Middle East and Ukraine, you know, China is probably more of an issue because if they, you know, finally carry through with their threat around Taiwan, Taiwan controls most of the semiconductors in the world. I mean, our economy is dependent on that, right? So it's irrational that people would be pushing to increase our dependence on China, given what's happened the last four years, but they continue to do that. It's irrational that the other side would say, we have to cut emissions in this country, even though we've already cut them something like 19, 20% by shutting down all of our, effectively all of our coal fired generation. But we have to keep cutting and China has only increased. China and India has only increased, as you say, because the third world, they're not gonna fire coal miners, right? That's only okay in the US and Europe, right? You know, and then and typically politicians used to focus on issues like that. But I think you've got so many conflicted politicians and others around this trade that they're making enough money and they have enough, they're accumulating enough political power that the rules don't apply anymore. Right. And I think we need to acknowledge that. So I would like to think that reason would work. And there's, there's no logic to any of this. You wouldn't be transitioning to wind and solar and shutting in natural gas right after you shut down coal and not building nukes. I mean, you know, that's a recipe for disaster, but still we're having these discussions. Still Germany is blowing up all of their coal plants and their nuclear power plants, you know, so you can never go back there. The UK did the same thing. It's not like we're going to revisit this. No government down the road can revisit this. So we're just, you know, going to roll the dice. So I, I'm not sure you can reason with some of the people on the other side, because unfortunately, I think they're arguing in bad faith. I mean, I would like to think that you can't fix stupid, which you can, but I don't think that's the problem. I think the other problem is they're not going to listen. And they've been telling us for 20 years, the debate is settled. So I think we need to force them again, using the legal system. We need to educate the public. We need to clearly educate the younger generations. Um, but I, I think we need to, to be aggressive like the other side has, just using you know, the legal system to reverse all of this, if you will. Yep. And, you know, I think I think it's and this is why I always put my hands up in the air when people say, you know, educating. And I would you know, if you got opportunities for me to come into a school. I'm happy to do it. Happy to go into colleges, universities, but really happy to go into younger schools and just talk to kids about, you know, running a business, but also, uh, you know, in energy, talking about energy because they don't know it. But you you make a really good point of um, and this is it, this kind of yesterday, actually listening to your book going through your book, uh, going through a couple other podcasts and Ukraine casts and catching up on the market and actually listening to the debate last night was a very, not that I haven't already made up my mind, but it was a nice crystallization and catalyst to, you know, if you are unclear or uncertain about the policies, now I think it's very interesting and it's, it's cute by half that both Walls and Harris have become gun owners and they've really become independents overnight. Basically, they are, they're darn near Republicans at this point um, because they've really catered to the middle. And I want to remind Mind if you are undecided, um, I want to remind people that that's exactly what the media did with Biden. And the media also didn't tell us that Biden, which most of us knew, um, that Biden was not uh, capable of really, he was a very frail old man to begin with. But, you know, so they didn't, they kind of covered that up. But more importantly, they, he was voted in as a centrist, a moderate Democrat, a kind of old school Democrat, as Joe Biden kind of was. And he has uh, his, uh, people running his administration, I feel like are very young ideologues, have run it as a very leftist administration. And I say that particularly on energy and why that matters is because it really wasn't talked about in the debate last night. Um, Vance closed with it and mentioned it. And he talked about, you know, he didn't say rising electricity prices, which he should have, but he talked about the inability to heat your homes and things like that. And it is the rising electricity prices. And I, you can pull up the data on the wind and solar in our grid right now and the aggressive push. And I believe it's, it's it's something like as it's tipping past this 10% mark into our grid, we have not added our grid, by the way, our grid is flat. We have 4,500 terawatt hours of power. It is flat. It declined a little bit last year. So we're decommissioning coal. We've added a little bit more natural gas, but we're adding all these renewables and we're not adding power. So one the AI revolution thing is going to work unless we add power generation. It's not going to be with wind and solar, but it seems to be that as you, as you point out, the critical mass, when you hit these renewables, the cost goes up significantly and then you have the intermittency and you have all these problems so there's massive cost increases with that and i think if you're talking about a, a harris or trump 
it's very, very clear. You will have more of the same under Harris. And it was actually um, it was actually Bolton in a Ukraine cast I was listening to who is anti-Trump. But he said, if you want to know what this administration, a Harris administration is going to be with regards to Ukraine, it's going to be exactly the same. And I thought, you know, I'm going to tell listeners that if you want to know what this administration is going to be for energy, it's going to be more of the same and it's going to be more aggressive. So you're being told that the I'm moderate and I'm, you know, all these things and I'm and you heard that in the other debate, I'm not going to ban fracking. Well, not banning fracking is very different from also pushing through a lot of this aggressive regulation. And for the oil and gas industry, I think it's really important to realize that, you know, another four years of this type of regulations is going to be harder to come back from. And I think that's what you're kind of alluding to with all this messaging on, on ESG is that it's just really, it can be done, but it's very difficult. It's very painful. And to me, it's more important that a lot of people are going to get hurt in this process, are getting hurt in this process, are unable to pay their bills right now because the cost of electricity is so high. And we have we have seventy dollar oil prices right now. If we had a hundred dollar oil prices, it's game over for this economy. I mean, it, it would be a death knell um, and put the U.S. in recession. Yeah, I would remind people back in two thousand. I guess it was twenty twenty um, during the Democratic primary down in Houston. Everyone on that stage basically couldn't wait to trash the oil and gas industry. And they were fairly Houston. explicit. Yeah, the, yeah, right. So that that is noteworthy because obviously that's the spiritual home of the industry. They went down there and were unafraid to speak their hate about the industry. And, you know, if you go back to the to the newsreel, you can see they were talking about banning fracking, including Kamala Harris. So as you say, there are ways to do that without coming out with a de facto right. fracking ban. You can use uh, setbacks, which you know in Colorado, right? And they're going to take that playbook in Pennsylvania. They're just waiting for this election to be over. So there are ways to shut down frack drilling in this country without coming out with a specific ban, right? And a lot of things that they're doing in the Permian are also going to accomplish that. The, the methane rules that they have, which are specific to the oil and gas industry, it, it's targeted discrimination that the regulator came out with, but it has a flaring ban. OK, so you're going to have gas oil mix around every well in the Permian. Right. Right. And, and depending on where you're drilling, you may have more of a higher gas split going forward. So if, if you can't get a pipeline in place on a timely basis and you can't flare that gas, you're going to shut in that oil well. Right. So that's one fairly ingenious way to shut in fracking and drilling or just right? or just limit development and prevent all new wildcatting and actually you know expanse and production of oil and gas in in the u.s because right. you don't drill a new well in it even in a known area drilling a new well doesn't have a pipeline next connected to it right and and the the onshore blm ruling around where you're allowed to lease that's been restricted now to areas with existing infrastructure right and they also jacked up the royalty rates as well but by by limiting to you areas where we already operate, the industry is not going to be de-risking step out areas, right? You're not going to have that normal function of, of finding out where the new frontiers are, depending on where prices go. So it's all meant to box in the industry. And over time, it will shrink production, right? So yeah, she can say I, I'm not, you know, it's, it's a little disingenuous on her part, because for the last four years, we've been looking at press releases that say, the Harris Biden administration or the Biden Harris yep. administration. Yep. First time we've ever had the VP's name on it. And now yep. in the last three months, she's been doing the moonwalk to step away from that saying, well, that wasn't me. Yep. You know, so it's 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 crazy that people may believe it, but they should be reminded, as you say, the last three years we've seen what they've tried to do. It'll be on steroids going forward if they get four more years, especially if the Congress is Democrat on both sides. Right. And it's it's so funny because um it's I mean it's not funny it's it's not disingenuous by half it's it's avert and lying and I will say the bot the the media is bought is hook line and sinker and it's to me it's disgusting it's really disgusting that we don't have you know like after the debate between Trump and Harris which was pretty atrocious I think on both sides but after that debate the next day was September 11th and you had them 
shaking hands. And no one mentioned the fact that Biden's standing there looking completely inept. He's the president of the United States, and he looks like a very old, frail man that no, doesn't know where he's at. That is, it's alarming, it's disheartening, it's disgusting where our media is at today in terms of the lack of critical analysis and coverage. But I pull the stuff, so when I give presentations and talks, and I tell people I'm very serious, it's primary resources. I mean, I'm, I read your book, but it's like I want to go back to the sources of a lot of stuff that, that when people have notes and I go find those and I go buy books and I keep going down holes. But when you actually look at the Biden administration, so I pull up slides, go to their website. It says Biden-Harris administration. This is something they were touting months and months ago, especially over the summer before Biden dropped out of the race. And it was Biden-Harris administration on the Inflation Reduction Act, which, as you point out in the book, is, a, is too cute by half because it's, it's, a, it's a spending bill, which is inflationary, and it's all energy stuff. And it's basically all handouts and giveaways and subsidies to every farmer and every DEI thing you can think of. But the other thing is that the actual energy policy, I mean, we know day one, we know the letters that the Biden administration sent out to Chevron and Exxon and condemning them for being horrible people who should pass on savings of oil and gas and stop taking on profits at the refinery, and which is ridiculous because they should be sending those same letters out to the CEO of Excel and the utility companies for raking in $24 million of profits this year and making huge salaries that the, the CEO of Excel makes. I mean, how come he's not getting that letter? That's because he's putting wind and solar into his grid. That's why. And um, you're not hearing the same thing. And then, then you also have like climate change executive order 14008, banning of all federal permits on day one for two months. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. Canceling Keystone Excel. I mean, it was clear there was, um, you know, there was it, there, this was the anti, most anti-domestic oil and gas administration we've ever had in the history of the U.S. And the industry was reluctant to admit that and still seems to be reluctant to talk about that. But it's it, that's real. And then so now when Harris says, well, we won't ban fracking. Well, you didn't ban fracking. And, and that's why I had put up an article with Real Clear Energy. Um, this we've had 13.2 million barrels a day of production, but it is not because of this administration. It is it's everything not because of it. it's because all the efficiencies we've had doing more with less, drilling longer laterals and pushing the industry to do more with less. And this industry is extremely innovative. But the industry has to be very careful is that, you know, 13.2 million barrels a day. That's it, it's incredible. And, and you know, the industry should be giving a big, you know, the administration should be giving a big thank you card to this industry for allowing, you know, production or prices would be much, much higher had we not been producing 13.2 million barrels a day. So I think it's just, it's, it's unbelievably serious. It's unbelievably serious when we get into China and emissions and coal and what we're producing and the fact that you don't make airplanes and you don't make missiles and you don't make tanks with wind and solar power. Um, you, you're going to need coal and your and ammunitions and just restockpiling. But um, if you allow me to to switch gears on your book, unless you you're more than welcome to comment and interrupt me. Uh, just one more. Uh, yeah, please. Comment that that you were just talking about. Um, so we're back to to north of 13 million yeah. barrels a day. That's basically recovering where we were in 2019. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. And if you look at the last four years, a lot of that has been driven by non-recurring factors, right? So you have a lot of private operators who continue to ramp up their production profiles because they were looking to to sell basically. So you've had this private to public consolidation within the industry. So that's non-recurring. I mean, if you look at the projections from the EIA going forward and particularly in 25, we're gonna to start to flatline, right? And if a lot of these mega mergers ultimately close, that's gonna to lead to a reduction in production, I think, right? So I think a lot of what we've seen has been positive and the industry has used to to hide behind, say, oh, we don't, we don't hate the industry. Look, we're at record levels of oil and gas production. But again, the past is 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 not a good framework for what's going to happen going forward. And for for natural gas, this LNG pause completely unwarranted. There's no need for it, but it's driven by climate policy. And if you look at LNG, that industry, and and take it all the way through globally, then yeah, you're not going to approve another LNG export facility, right? So I think that will be a very aggressive step to go to a moratorium for new LNG projects. But clearly, the Democrats have been agitating for that over the last few years. So I think, again, it's going to get more real. The industry has is resilient. I agree. One thing I'm concerned about is, is the going if the going gets really tough here, maybe we see a replay of what happened back in the 1990s. You know, everyone left the Permian. A lot of the independents became internationally oriented. 
you know, so Exxon is developing offshore Guyana. Obviously, that's a world class oil play, but you may see the hostility here in terms of, of the industry mean that it's going to be a renewed focus on international and offshore plays in the third world. Because again, in the crazy calculus that is climate and ESG, producing oil and emissions in the third world is okay. You just can't do it in the developed world. And it would be very, very disappointing to me if the industry would to, you know, take that cynical approach rather than standing and fighting here. And in order to stand and fight, they need to start to speak up uh, a little more aggressively for themselves. I mean, who's uh, going to want to work for an oil and gas company if the CEO is is not strong enough to to speak out these truths, right? Including around climate science. I I beyond hundred percent agree. And that's the thing is when you actually talk to people, and we are we are going to come back to the book because all it all links and comes back, folks. But if you just give me a second to tie this all together with a nice bow. So Paul does a great job within the book of really um, all the stuff when you think about the UN. So when you dive into this stuff, if you if you are interested at all and you start looking at China and you start getting into coal use and you you'll you'll get into the U United Nations stuff. I mean, China has a China actually has an over over present uh, role within the United Nations and the UN is has a incredibly large role within ESG, which um, Paul lays out very clearly in the book. We actually talk about that a lot on the first podcast I had you on. I was talking about the UN's role within the sustainable d development um, goals and within all these initiatives and everything that actually funnels itself into the ESG metrics that is used within the stock market. So there's this like nice thread between the UN and all these sustainable development goals, which the Belt and Road Initiative for China is now it's now labeled, you know, green belt and road by the UN and hits all the SDG targets and all the, all this stuff. But you also tie this into universities and you also tie this and we see this. And I think that there's, there's something I've seen in the oil and gas industry. And I, I mean, I, I am very proud to be, you know, I'm a, a senior or energy fellow with the common sense Institute here in Denver, Colorado. Um, it's a bipartisan organization. And, you know, I really do like being bipartisan on many things. And I have been very hesitant to get overly political, but I'm about ready to run for office because I'm that upset about what's going on. And when I went to Wyoming a couple weeks ago and I met the governor of Wyoming, I was really damn proud to be from Wyoming. And I was proud that he was explaining what his state did and he was proud of it, that they produce this coal and they use it to turn the lights on and they have lower cost electricity than we do in Colorado. And they're proud of it. And then they took us to the mine. They took us to all these state legislators to the mine and then they let me talk to these state legislators. And you know, it was amazing was over dinner we're talking and I'm hearing from all these states and what they do and they all they don't have the same policies that we have in Colorado where they have just they think we, we they think we have fallen off a cliff with Excel in Colorado because they actually care in Nebraska in Iowa and Kansas they all care about affordability and reliability and the ability to turn their lights on and in Colorado we care about it seems that we care more about going green than we do about people being able to heat or cool their homes and survive. And that is really where the human aspect of this is completely lost. And your book helped, you know, put this in really just, it summarizes all this in a really great context. But I think industry leaders, and you'll hear Harold Hamm say it, you know, when he did his book tour, and his book is great, you guys should, uh, or you guys should read it. But, you know, Harold Hamm will say, yeah, more people need to get out, but more people need to do it. Industry leaders, and if you're private, I really encourage you, you have the ability as a private oil company, much more so than probably a public one to do it. But if Chris Wright can do it, if he can get on stage, if Chris Wright can be canceled on LinkedIn, if he can get on CNBC, if he can be in the Wall Street Journal, and he can do what he does, you all can do it too. And if you can't do it, I'm happy to take a role as a CEO and do it for you. Because you guys need to, like, the industry needs to have some backbone and needs to actually do it. And I know being a, like running an oil company is very, very difficult, but you're not making it any easier by pacifying these people who want to put you out of business. And I think that the reason the book is so important and, you know, everybody likes fossil future and moral case for fossil fuels and all these things. But uh, Paul's book needs to be in every office and he needs to let me do the audio for it so that you all will listen to it um, and then have him come speak because it's really important in terms of how all this stuff gets pulled together. And it actually, I'm, I'm hoping Paul and I will end up getting to do some work together on, you know, you do a great job in the article pulling some data and things, but I think more work on exposing China's role and what's actually going on and just the, the data points and factors of how manufacturing works, how energy works, how the systems work, and then how, where ESG's role is in this and how we need to dispel that. But Paul, will you mind if I read just like a paragraph from the second uh, chapter? It's like page 18, just the paragraph of the book. Um, sure, let me, let me just throw in that th this climate agenda feeds right into China's 2040 long-term plan. Absolutely. I mean, this is basically 
uh, Europe and the U.S. helping China achieve its goal, right? Yeah, and that's probably, that is another podcast, but I've been doing a lot of work on this. So if you're relegating your manufacturing and production capacity to China by lowering your CO2 emissions and allowing them to increase, that's exactly what you're doing. Um, okay, so Paul's book, The Race to Zero, How ESG Investing Will Crater the Global Financial System. Um, you, this was published when? Just recently, right? Uh, February of this year it came out. February of this year. Okay. So this is page 18. This is a couple, like, end of chapter two. And he says, the history of anti-capitalism is now repeating itself with, sustain with sustainability, which borrows elements from both totalitarian and reformist approaches of the past. Sustainability seeks to work within the capitalist system to harness its productive capacity and create a virtual state-directed global economy, one where social pressure is used to align government and business interests and control private property. Under the moral coverage of a looming environmental crisis and the existential threat of climate change, it seeks to impose a comprehensive set of liberal policy values on all companies. It is basically an attempt to build a totalitarian system of conformity across the business sector based on moral suasion, thereby avoiding the administrative costs and public sector responsibility associated with outright state ownership or direct government intervention. It embraces both state and progressive priorities, but is mainly, mainly the fabrication of a permanent permanent super rational bureaucracy of technocrats such as the w uh, or residing at multilateral agencies led by the un and international ngos such as the wef which effectively insulates it, it from accountability at the ballot box in friedman's words it, in quote it is an attempt to claim collectivist ends without collective means end quote which i just thought was an incredible paragraph that really succinctly one it captures the first couple paragraphs but it's kind of a thread of the entire book and he does a great great job of explaining all that yeah i mean you have to think of it as the government as the puppet master working through the financial markets um and that's partly so that there's no blame or fingerprints right and you know when things go wrong over the next few years if we continue down this path you know, the government and the activists will blame the industry primarily for the volatility in prices, the scarcity. It will always be the fault of business. So we're blaming the victim here. And I think, you know, the industry really needs to acknowledge that and become a little more self-aware um, because clearly the other side's not going to back away. There's no logical argument that you can use at this point, And we're 40 years into it. So we need to acknowledge that we're late in the game. I don't think we can disabuse the other side of their beliefs, and it is a belief system. It's a religion when it comes to climate uh, and the goal of reducing emissions. So, you know, we have to use legal force, you know, to try and, you know, shake them into, because if we don't, then it's going to take a catastrophe, a human tragedy, you know, people dying again, like we saw in Texas, because we have a power outage that's extended during the winter, right? Um, you know, so hopefully it doesn't come to that. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, individuals, lawmakers, particularly the industry, you know, you know, should be coming together and more people should speak out if they can. I mean, I wrote the book because I retired from my Wall Street job. I couldn't have written this book if I still worked in the industry. OK, so that's by design. No one is allowed to speak up and it's across the board. So I understand that. But if you have the ability to do it, it's your obligation, I think, to speak obvious truths. So Harold Ham is taking his company private. He clearly has yep. no worries about the capital markets or people telling him what to do around ESG. So he should be becoming a more vocal um, proponent of the industry and challenge the whole underlying premise. If we don't challenge the premise of climate, then we're just going to be arguing about execution details, right? You know, we have to address that head on at this point in the game, because if we don't, you know, the other side is going to dismiss everything we say as, as, as you know, they're not going to listen to us anyway. Right. 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 So, and I, so, and Paul does such a, you do such a great job of concisely putting that into a book form. That's like, it's, it's, in, in a very good word format. So I encourage everyone to read it. I really do. I know this only got at least my industry and how I, how I work. Um, and I like things on audio. So I put it on Speechify um, and I was cramming it. Uh, but I, I, I think it would be awesome to have it in an audio form. But I think I love that you just ask, you know, you just task oil and gas industry leaders to do more. And um, I would say, you know, leaving on a positive note, 
So there's a lot that the industry, the industry needs to do more. That's very, very clear. Um, I've joined, uh, in addition to that, that energy fellow group that I'm an energy fellow with the Common Sense Institute, I'm now part of uh, Jason Isaacs, uh, the American Energy Institute, which is, I think clearly uh, not so much partisan as it is a adv it is a trade association for oil, natural gas, and coal. So it is unswervingly and un it's not uh, it's not apologizing for um, talking about the oil, gas, and coal industry, the traditional fuel industry, and it's so critically important because there really isn't a lot of entities doing this. And what Paul's book does on ESG is uh, solidifies a lot of that of how all this stuff is working within the system. I think there's two things I would like to dispel maybe before you before I let you go. Um, and there's probably a whole nother podcast we need to do just on China and the control angle. But uh, is the ha have folks in the oil and gas industry, so a lot of maybe some younger folks drank the Kool-Aid a little bit, uh, or not even just the oil and gas industry, but thinking that, you know, some of these ESG metrics aren't that bad. And if we comply with them, that will actually be helpful. You know, we've talked about this before. I've had, um, I've had uh, Dan Romito on the podcast from, um, from Pickering Energy Advisors, and they're big proponents of ESG. And we've we've went kind of rounds on our podcast where I had him on. I think he's an amazing person, but I'm not a big fan of voluntarily doing ESG metrics. And I'm just curious if you think there's a lot of people who are trying to do the right thing, but it's actually, um, it's being distorted, as your book sort of kind of alludes to, is that no matter what you do, it's not really helping. Is there is there something to that, or am I wrong on that? No, I, I would agree. I think, you know, some of these, I mean, it, it's good that we have continued investment in energy, but you know, some of these investors that style themselves as cleaner energy investors, or they only invest in cleaner fossil fuel companies based on whatever metric, whether it's intensity or what have you, how much water they use. Again, you're conceding the point there. You're conceding the point that this whole ESG framework is actually legitimate and it, it, it's relevant for financial performance, which it's not, but whatever spin you want to put on it and companies have tried this too i mean you mentioned kind of go phillips you know we're going to set a net zero target for whatever scope one and two and you know they got smacked down because it's only about scope three and i think it's the same with with some energy investors who style themselves as the whole argument that the whole phraseology of clean energy again is using the language of the left right we should get away from that and even vance did that in the in the debate last night you know, he didn't really get into a discussion, which I understand why you wouldn't around just the, the, the science. But at some point we need to do that. But then we, he uses the same terms like clean. You know, we're clean. Yeah, but he didn't say. Fo yeah, but it's the same to me. It's the same thing as saying fossil. So it's traditional fuels. Call it coal and natural gas. Don't call it. But don't call it fossil fuels. Call it, call it coal, oil and natural gas. I mean, fossil fuels has such a negative connotation. And then we say clean. And even the, you know, everybody does it. I mean, it's it's they're not actually clean. I do thought I do think that the thing that Vance highlighted and it hasn't been connected and something I spent a lot of time on is the connection of slave labor, forced labor and coal-fired power generation, they're the two single biggest input costs that are further subsidized by China to make them competitive. China could not compete against anyone if they didn't have free labor, and a lot of things are very, very cheap labor and often forced, and very, very cheap coal, which is further subsidized. And so that's how they can make a crappy t-shirt, but that's also how they make their Huawei phones, and that's how they make you know military equipment that they're sending to Russia, is it's, it's through those means. But no, you, I, I understand the point you're making. I just, I, I don't know if a lot of, if there's a reason why a lot of industry leaders are afraid to speak out. So there's, there's one, you know, they're afraid they're going to get canceled. And I, I think you have to just be realized that, you know, you're only going to get canceled if you allow that, you know, you have to, you have to push forward. And I think it is behoove people. You have to do it because no one, no one's going to defend you. No one's going to talk about this. But I also think that the industry seems to at least, I, I know people at universities that were asked to come into a lot of oil and gas boardrooms, people from universities who don't like these guys and who are literally spending a lot of money putting them out of business. And um, you talk about Columbia University in your book. That's kind of one I'm mentioning. But I mean, there's a lot of folks five years, six years ago that were how much money was going to these universities, hoping that they were going to pacify these guys, thinking they were doing good. And I think we, the industry needs to be more honest with itself of how do you spend money and how do you do it right? And I think getting stuff like this out into the public space, there's so limited knowledge on what you're talking about and what I'm talking about on the stock market where we're actually evaluating. It's very, very hard to evaluate companies, oil and gas companies that are publicly traded now because the anti-sentiment, the demonization of oil and gas is so high that oil and gas is not 
appropriately evaluated it within the market. Um, and that's kind of maybe, you know, something you and I can work on in the future, but it's, it's something that you think about. I thought about when I was reading your book, but it's not something that's well addressed of how are we appropriately evaluating traditional fuels right now and in the future? I mean, I would say energy companies on top of being more outspoken, uh, they should be more selective about their investors. Absolutely. I mean, more picky, right? So if you have an investor, even if they, they style themselves as an energy investor that wants to talk about ESG metrics, whatever their metrics are, I don't think that's a quality investor. I think at, at, at some point you're going to lose them because, again, the, the program is changing. If this SEC rule comes down or other regulations or the European regulations, which won't be stopped, wash ashore here in this market, you're going to lose those investors. I think you'll sometime in the next two years, most European investors, both debt and equity, will divest from oil and gas because all of the regulations they passed over there will not allow them um, politically right. to invest anymore. So we're going to lose European investors. We've lost college endowments in the US, right? We're going to lose insurance companies because on the business side, they fought into this climate argument um, around weather being this, this terrible risk now for their claims. And there are a lot of investment managers who believe this stuff, right? I mean, BlackRock, you're very outspoken about it. You know, at the right point, they, once they have regulatory cover, they will probably become more aggressive in terms of implementing their agenda. So you're gonna lose a lot of investors. Let's just pick the investors now that you know are in it because they only care about making a financial return and they're not going to judge you based on some sort of subjective moral framework, right? You know, a lot of the uh, private equity funds that I'm familiar with that I've done business with over the last 10, 20 years, you know, they have great track records, right? You know, if they're an EMP or midstream, if they're focused on the Permian, you know, over the last 10 years, they've traded well. Every capital raise for a new fund has become tougher and tougher because yep. they're losing more and more investors each go around as the program becomes more uh, difficult in terms of what needs to be done on the ESG side. So we may get to the point where only red states and high net worth individuals who don't care, a lot of them are liberal too, I would argue, uh, are investing in, in oil and gas. But you know, I, I think anyone who wants to talk about ESG metrics is not a real investor. And eventually you're just gonna have more difficult conversations with that group. So companies should basically decide who they want to do business with, right? And the industry is in a better position to, to give that directive because they're living within cash flow, right? They're not as dependent on the external markets. Certainly the larger public companies can be more selective. So I, some of these energy investors that are trying to have it both ways, I don't agree with. I've spoken at conferences attended by them and they've been fairly shrill in terms of their criticism of my views. Uh, and the energy companies that have been in attendance have also kind of turned white not wanting to react to what I say. So it just shows you that, you know, there's a lot of fear out there. Yeah, there is. I, I think I was invited to, I spoke at a Payne Institute event called on responsible natural gas. And um, I, that is. yeah, whatever that is. So it was, uh, they asked me what it was. And I told them when I finally got to speak and I said, uh, what they said, what should we do? And I said, we should produce every damn drop we have in the U.S. and get it across the world. And nearly you would have thought a pin drop, you would have thought the like the mic drop, these people like lost their minds. And this is in Colorado and this is with oil and gas people in the room. I obviously, I was not invited back. Um, but I think that, uh, you know, and I think this is kind of, you're sort of, this is a one hit wonder, but I can tell you just from knowing, um, so I know that the demand for the knowledge is there because I know the people who dial into the podcast, I know people who just reach out via email, you know, at least several a week and, or on LinkedIn and say, Thank you so much for this information. Um, and I know that the sound might say this podcast might sound a little biased, but I can promise you that there's just a lot of passion here and a lot of work that has gone into the work I've done and in, in clearly in your book and all the research you do. But I really do want to end this on a positive note for listeners of what is the go forward? You know, I, I think that I really encourage people to, you know, work with folks like me so we can get more of this information out there. Um, like you guys, you're putting out this work, you're putting this out there. But what are you doing to get that information out there? And how are you, you know, in your new role as a, I know you're an advisor on the National Center for Energy Analytics. You're also a senior fellow, but beyond that writing, you know, I sometimes think we, we have to be a little bit careful in this industry. The answer is always build a think tank and just write something. You have to do things um, and you have to speak and educate. So beyond that, how do we, you know, how do we help move the needle here? Yeah, well, I think, you know, our approach around the, the papers we put out is, is to 
use it to drive policy, maybe to drive, you know, targeted lawsuits. You know, it's the ammunition for the argument, right? And hopefully we get more, again, I'm, I'm, it's great if this is going to be bipartisan. I don't think it will be. So, it, you know, we need to focus on the Republican side uh, and like-minded people in terms of leading the legal charge, having the hearings, you know, taking the case to the courts, which we're doing at, at the red state level. You know, we've, we've challenged West Virginia versus EPA. We've challenged the SEC rules. We've challenged both EPA directives. So the red states are leading the charge there. And we're also passing a lot of anti-ESG laws at the state level. Yep. which are going after banks and investment firms that have signed on with this ESG program, which is eventually going to become more discriminatory. And so the states are taking it to some of the lead actors on the ESG side, you know, but I think we would just want to give, you know, the, the, the intellectual backup again, because there's safety in numbers, as I mentioned, if we can get more politicians on the Republican side to be more comfortable to talk about this, more easily in public, like J.D. Vance did, right. I would argue, then, you know, over time, you know, it'll be it'll be a movement. And, and you know, what and the other side fears is that you're going to talk out loud about how crazy their argument is, right? Point out their craziness in public. That's the best defense we have. And I think that's where I really think, and I say this a lot, but knowledge is power. And that's where I think, like, the data, at least, oh, my goodness, the data on China doesn't lie. I mean, it, it is... China has a third of the world's power generation capacity, and over half of that is in coal, and that is more power generation capacity than we have total. So, I mean, that's the data. And uh, I, I don't know if it's it's more, uh, you know, I'll continue to do more podcasting, inviting, you know, Paul to come speak at your conference, talk about his book, let us tag team it. Um, clearly, we're pretty good at this. Um, but uh, so, I mean, having, getting, do you think getting more, you uh, getting more knowledge into the hands of people within the industry and people who can talk about this, getting politicians more knowledgeable, having information, having numbers, being able to talk about the economics and being like, that's gotta be, to me, that's it, that's one of my number ones. But I, do you also agree with that? Yeah, we have to get over the fear factor for, for everyone involved. You know, whether you work in the financial markets, whether you work in industry, whether, you know, you're a politician, you know, at the federal level where I think there's the most, ambivalence and, uh, you know, incompetence, if you will. Um, so we all need to get on the same page and education is a big part of that. So if, if you're not armed with, with all of the data, right. And if you don't have a basic understanding about all the flaws in the climate data, both historical and the current measured data and how the models always misfire and how the message is being manipulated. I mean, I almost cannot watch the weather here in the greater tri-state area because every, every news forecast and every news show starts with the weather and how it's exceptional that, you know, it's been dry for two days or it's raining today. So, you know, they're catastrophizing, you know, normal weather events. It's the, B doing... the BBC, which they live in the, it's the, in rain. I mean, it's raining in London all the time, but I mean, well, the right. BBC and, and climate is amazing. Down south, obviously we, we have a tragedy with, with Hurricane Helene, but you know, I think that's more of a tragedy of, of government in terms of, you know, the emergency response or the lack thereof than the fact that we had a hurricane hit in a hurricane zone during hurricane season, right? So, and we go through this every year. And, and the people that are saying this on the other side are old enough to know better. Yep. And if you look at the data, you know, you know, we really have not seen an uptick over the last 100 plus years in terms of landfalling severe hurricanes. The only reason why the cost has gone up is because of inflation recently, yep. right? But but you put that data in front of them and some people refuse to listen to it. So I think, again, we need to accept that and focus on those people who have the power to help drive this thing in the other direction. So, Yeah, that's fantastic, Paul. Well, thank you so much. And we didn't even... We didn't even really talk geopolitics too much or how this comes back to inflation and war and all that stuff. So maybe another time. But, um, Paul, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Is there is there anything you want to close that I that we didn't mention in the book that you just really think people need to know or um, you think we got it covered? No, I mean, the last chapter is, is key because it kind of lays out the playbook of how we turn this thing around. So the title of the book is scary, you know, but. I'm very optimistic, right? And and over the last you know few months since the book came out, I've met a lot of new people uh, who are of the same mind. So again, I think we all need to just work together, 
coordinate because clearly the other side is very coordinated. But I think we have logic uh, and 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 the the uh, spacing on this. Uh, I think we have the best interests of the American people on our side because clearly ESG and climate these are all anti-human agendas. And the other side can't argue with the fact that it's going to hurt individual humans. It may save the planet, which it won't. That's their argument that they use. But they're justifying, you know, that planetary threat to inflict a lot of pain on individual Americans. So I think we need to be confident in speaking that out. Yeah, no, I think you say that really well. And if it wasn't for Speechify taking off my um, my good uh, British voice that I had going and not putting on a computer, I would have got to the last chapter. Um, but I will. And I would say that uh, I really think it's the same type of information that does need to get mainstream. Um, I think that it's not just, and I say, you know, having people who write something that you like what they say and having them come to a conference, that's great. But it's that stuff has to get permeated into the market. And I, I want to hear more stuff. You know, I want to hear the stuff I talk about. I want to hear the stuff Paul talks about in the Wall Street Journal, in the Financial Times, in, on Bloomberg, on CNBC. And I want to hear that coverage within the market because truly, you know, we have to vet, we have to appropriately evaluate these assets. And that's how it there's a role for this within inform the information flow and it needs to get out there. And I think that is literally um, louder voices, not crazy voices. This is economics and reasoning. And as you say, this is this does come back to the economy. This does come back to reasoning and um, and quality of life and really human dignity and the ability to, to thrive and flourish um, and to compete in the global economy. I agree. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Paul. Really appreciate it. And we will definitely have you back. Okay. Thanks, folks. Thanks, Enjoy it. Uh, bye.